faculty assessment of our information uh, literacy modules, and we're going to be showing you some video clips of the focus group and how we're responding to them. But we want to start off with some history. And basically, from 2008 is when we started using information literacy modules. That's when I became uh, head of the iOS department. We had two modules. Gretchen and I worked on them. Gretchen, as we know, has the voice. So she did the voice and the recording. That was back in the day when there was no Adobe Captivator Camtasia, so it was really hard. We only had two searching, finding, evaluating articles and searching, finding, evaluating books. Now we have five modules. They're all based on our information literacy standards. They're general, not discipline specific. And they're focused on undergraduate, but what you're going to find interesting when we show you our data is around 11 to 12% of seniors and undergraduates take these uh, modules. And the thing that we think is very important is that they are embedded in Blackboard. And the reason we did that is because that's where students live. Everything is in Blackboard for them. So that's where we put it, faculty are in Blackboard, librarians are now in Blackboard. So that's the way where we wanted to go. And I just wanted to give you a real life example of this. When I taught Honors 50 this semester, uh, I signed up for, for Remind 101, which is a free text-based based service for students. So I could, it's like I could send them uh, Twitter. And so if, what was very interesting, they all signed up for it. And if I sent them you know, the official email via Blackboard, maybe half of them bothered to even read it, but everyone read the Remind 101 because they got immediate responses. So to me, that just tells you right then and there that people are more into getting immediate information. So. <coughs> We're going to give you some statistics in terms of uh, the using of the number of students. And as you can see, the, these are the uh, year. So fall 09 to spring 10, so it's like a whole semester, fall and spring semester. And uh, this is just for the book and the article. So as you can tell the different numbers of that whole year, how many students took the, uh, this is for the book for that year, and then this is the last semester. And that's for the book, and that's for the article. I'm gonna show you the uh, choosing a topic and citing a plagiarism. So it follows the same path of the year and the total number of students that took it. And then this is our demographics in terms of the freshmen through uh, grad students who actually take these classes. And uh, these here are the year down here. And according to the legend, the freshman, the sophomore, the junior, senior, and then um, as you can tell, as we get more into the last year and the year before, we have the grad students start taking them as well. And this is for the book and the article. And then this is the citing and the choosing a topic. So we still have a, a majority of our client or uh, patrons are actually freshmen, but the other groups are picking up as well. Can I ask a question? Yes. No? Um, the citing one before the number of students that so took it was over 2,300. That seems, compared to that, it's really high. And is that because more professors are there's, emphasizing that? There's a reason for that. Yeah. Um, we had uh, Dr. Lax in psychology assign his Psych 10 students to take that, and that was 700 students. Mm -hmm. So that made a big difference. Mm -hmm. And as we get more further along in our presentation, we're going to be talking about how the percentage has really changed of people assigning these now rather than extra credit. We just want to give you a background in terms of the changes through the years. And then we'll go more in detail into why these changes happen. And then I'm going to give you just a background of our assessments and what we've done in the past. In spring 2011, we had students evaluate the uh, books and articles database. And the way they did that was we used MORE, which is a tracking system. So we had them do 10 tasks, and we videotaped them, and we had them talk aloud. So we could exactly see where they failed and where they were successful. And then at the end, we had a, uh, like a survey. Questions like, on you know, where else would you like to see the information literacy modules, what worked for you, what didn't, things like that. And um, what we got out of that is that the students 
passed all the tests except for uh, how to uh, search academic search premier. And the reason is, is they got confused about that Google search interface that we have. So even though the database talks about how to, you know, go through the like five steps to get there, they could not apply that. So we thought that was an interesting finding. Um, also, in um, that assessment, they don't use, uh, the only way they find Blackboard is they search it via Google. And so we decided, why do we need to explain students how to find the library's homepage? Because they don't care, they just search it via Google. So we changed that. Um, another thing was, those very interesting students, we asked them, where else would you like to see information literacy modules? And they said the library's homemade, excuse me, homepage, email to all of the students, and even my Fresno State page. So they had a lot of interesting suggestions that we'd like to incorporate. And then in spring 2012, um, let me just backtrack to 2011. We did 25, wasn't a thing, but we had 23 because there were a couple of corrupted uh, studies. We did 43, correct? 42 in 2012, 39 um, actually did it without it being corrupted. And this time we did the uh, choosing a topic and citing in plagiarism. And these are more uh, practical um, tutorials. And for the citing and plagiarism, the task that they had to do was create a mind map because was, that's what they're taught. All of them could do that. And then in the citing and plagiarism, they had an assessment to take and they all passed it. So we thought they did really well. Um, and that proved that they could actually take the modules and accomplish what they're supposed <laughs> to learn. And as far as the problems we found out is that they could not print the certificate. And um, to respond to that, we've made Astronomical we then made a screenshot, a picture, a, a Q and A, and then they also didn't know, you know, because now the web being so interactive in Blackboard, they have problems manipulating Blackboard, and they thought they could just click on things, and you can't do that on Blackboard on the pictures. So we worked with uh, Digital Campus to make some changes on where we put the library modules, and then I'm going to turn over to 2013 to thank. For um, 2013, as we put it here, it was uh, the teaching faculty who assessed the uh, information literacy modules, and we had a focus group going. So let me go a little more into detail into that. We called for volunteers, and uh, the requirement that we had for the faculty is that they had to at least use one of the modules in their class. So they've done it, they've used it before. And uh, we had a $150 professional fund for the um, faculty who did this. And then we had a blackboard set up where, well, rubric, which Monica's going to pass out here. Um, we got a couple that has the people ask their suggestions. They put it right in the back. And a couple of them that they just went through the rubric and then they just marked what they thought. So we had a rubric so that they can mark and they can tell us exactly what they thought. And they submitted the rubric in blackboard as if they were students so that we can go in and download it and then print out all the rubrics and their grading on it. Um, it's just a mix, so there's no one particular one. They, they're all mixed there. And um, so we figured we did it that way, and then we'll have the focus group where we can actually film them and look through their video and ask them specific questions. And we talked to the, uh, uh, we went actually had a group together, and if they could attend the focus group, um, they had to send in their comments and suggestions through email to me. So either way, they were part of the assessment because we want to make sure that we had 10 faculty uh, to be able to present and give us information. This is the focus group. And um, each of them did it differently. We can talk a little bit more. But for uh, Annabella and Christina, they're from the Chicano Latino Studies. I'm working with them a little bit on embedded librarianship with them. So um, with them, they use this. Um, Loretta, she, from the Women's Studies, she does this, and she uses the citing and plagiarism a lot. And she's really critical about that tutorial there. So um, she uses that for her class a lot. And um, Cricket and Mary um, and Helga, they use it from the Health Science, Nursing, and uh, Public Health. So they use it as uh, extra credit, as supplementary. And then Debbie Kemp, who's in business law, she uh, is so entranced by the information literacy modules, she wants to make her own, the focus is more in her area, and we want to help her do that. 
and then John Bynum from English. He has, we'll show you his videos, he has a very interesting approach. He shows uh, the information literacy modules appropriate to his course, and then he has them do exercises in class. In fact, he's made 10 exercises based on them. And then Arun in IT has his students do them throughout the semester, and he's done an assessment for us on the, the efficacy of them in IT. Um, the way, some of the ways that faculty use the information literacy modules is number one, to do a flipped classroom. And I can just give my own self as a, an example when I taught my honors class, rather than me having to talk about how to, you know, find books, articles, I would have them do that and then reinforce it in the classroom, so be more specialized. And I've noticed that when we had our focus group, some of the other faculty are doing that too. Another thing that we're noticing is that they're um, spacing them throughout the class, throughout the semester. So in the, in the past, they would just assign them like the first, second, or week, you know, extra credit, no biggie. And then now, since we've been working with them for with the information literacy modules and with TILT, they are making it part of the assignment and incorporating learning objectives. And then you're going to talk about the rest of these. And then um, the other thing, too, is that a lot of them, they use it for introduction in terms of before they come to your library class or they come to your library session, you would ask them, can you have your students do the information with finding, searching, evaluating articles? So that when the students get there, they know a little bit about what you're talking about, so you can kind of focus on what you want to teach instead of going back and say, this is how you search for a book, this is how you search for an article. So a lot of them, they use it for that before they come into the library to do library instruction. And then a lot of them, they incorporate it right into their course lecture, especially with the, art, the assignment research calculator. They take certain segments that they're going to be using, and then they incorporate it right into their lecture and say, this is, uh, we'll be writing a paper, this is where you need to go, here's the link to it that will explain to you uh, where the learning center is, how do you first start your draft, how do you write a thesis statement. So some of them incorporate it right into their um, lecture notes and their lecture courses. And a lot of them used to do extra credit, but now they're like making it part of the grade, where they're saying, oh, you, it's part of the grade, it's part of the library session class that you have to take. So um, those are some of the stuff. And I'm going to show you a video that shows an example of how uh, John uses the information literacy module in his class. One of the things I really like doing with my classes is after having you know, gone through the tutorials, modeling, you know, searching, um, I have had them do, uh, I call them scavenger hunts or something, but what they do is they get in groups, and in groups, I've given them a slip of paper in which it says, you know, find a book, that, blah, 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 and I set out the parameters, what does the book you know, need to do, and then find an article that does, blah, 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 and what does it need to do, find a reference work that does, blah, blah, blah. And they have to bring them all back to the class, and so they get, and since I teach a two-hour class, it works, because I can let them go for about 40 minutes, and they can do that, and then we can come back, and then we can talk, start looking at them, and what we do is we, um, with the doc, document camera, I'll take each of the sources and we'll start like looking at all the different features, like okay, what's the imprint, who's the press. So if it's a university press, it's like, okay, so, you know, it's this University of Minnesota here, that uh, means that that's a scholarly source. And, or here's the bio of the um, editor of this volume, and here's how you use an index, and here's the table of contents. So it, that, Sometimes it's really useful to have the actual object there so they can start looking at it and see if the book is going to be exactly things going to be useful to them. Instead of, uh, after he goes through the tutorial, the students go through it, he reinforces by having them actually doing the practice, and then he shows the whole class on it. This is a good source, what you guys did was great, this is not a really good source to use. So he's actually using it and teaching it in his class. Go back to my PowerPoint. And this just gives you a little bit of statistics in terms of what they're using the class for. Remember when we were talking about how some of the classes are, the last couple years was higher because they're actually using it as an assignment. And you can tell we, with the articles and the citing and plagiarism, we just gave you some examples that the professor assigning it as a class actually went a whole lot more than any other ones that, um, it used to be that they used to do it for extra credit only but now they're actually a part of the class, now they're assigning it. And we just started collecting data on this within the, this last year. So 
we found some commonalities about the teaching faculty, and one which you know we all know they do care about their students and the quality of their research. And we've got a video clip to show you about their concerns about how they do uh, library research. They, they can go, they can go to a computer, they can do the research, they can find books, but they just don't know the difference. Yeah. Oh. They have a hard time. Yeah. Well, and with other types of students, a lot of them, they've they've come to find their own way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes those aren't the best ways. Yeah, exactly. They may have learned something yeah. earlier, but they've like latched on to, yeah. ooh, book reviews are shorter, so I'm going to find book reviews yeah. instead. So they start yes. signing book yeah. reviews, and you yeah. have to tell them that that doesn't count. Yeah. Yeah. Or that you, don't, you, know, you, you want them to do more than book reviews. Yeah. Um, or sometimes, you know, the students will have found like the database they want to use, and that's mm -hmm. the only database exactly. they want to use. So they just say, "Oh, I just go to JSTOR," yeah. and then I'll say, "Well, okay, you've got to broaden." Yeah. You know. And then we have another uh, video that we want to show you that talks about how um, ease, how they use it, uh, the information literacy modules, the ease of it, and how a lot of the online and um, hybrid classes, how they like to embed that into the courses, and um, there are a lot, of, a lot of faculty, they really want to uh, help the students, but a lot of times they're really busy. So the convenience of having a lot of these provided for them really helps them. And uh, I'm going to show you that clip. The information is very straightforward. And um, <clears throat> something about the format, um, because I found that even if I give a lecture in class, um, with the same information that you provide, my students seem to prefer um, the online tutorials. So I think it's very straightforward and in the format that is important. Why do you think they prefer the online versus the um, class? Probably for the convenience. They can do it on their own time. Um, they can you know, do it in their dorm rooms or you know, when it's um, I think they also felt less pressure, right? They don't have to, I mean, they should take notes, but in class, you know, they have to kind of keep up mm -hmm. at my pace, and this can be kind of their own pace. Mm -hmm. I like that, um, you know, I don't have to spend as much time on those topics in class. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not a librarian, and, and I mean, I know how to do research, but I don't really know how to teach someone to do research either, other than for um, so this is nice because I can just kind of talk about it very briefly in class or you know I do have them come and you do a great job talking to them about it in more detail but this way I can just you know have them learn those things that are important and um, but not take up class time necessarily for it. We want to talk a little bit about the discoveries that we found, the little treasure troves that we found as we were having these common uh, the focus groups with them. And uh, the first thing we want to cover is the PR or marketing of the um, information literacy modules and the library services. And we have a video that shows you real quick exactly on some of the stuff that they were talking about. Maybe you could have a tutorial for professors, <laughs> you know, that's we're, what we're thinking yeah. of doing, like in the fall. Yeah, but actually having in-person training, right. but the tutorial. Yeah, I think that, that and then maybe like send out an email to like the faculty sort of and tell them, you know, this is like this. You can find and ideas for your classes. And we pay you five bucks to do it. <laughs> 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 five bucks. Yeah. You know, but I mean, I think a lot of time <laughs> professors are looking for things to do that are low cost for them, so that they don't have to go out and start from scratch. Exactly. Right. And so if if you give them a, a somewhere where they can go and just going quickly, get an exercise and pull it out. I mean, I would certainly use it. Um, I think a lot of professors would because, you know, you just don't want to, a lot of professors don't have time maybe to spend, you know, doing the research, figuring out all the things that they need to do. When you have a moment, go back into yeah. information literacy yeah. modules and go to lesson plans because we have like yeah, in class, online, yeah. you know, you per, per uh, I think for around three of them. Yeah. And then we can we provide your student learning outcomes, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. So you can just yeah. pretty much take it. Yeah, see, I, I bet you a lot of people don't know. Yeah, no, I yeah. didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. We, yeah. We, yeah. we started that last semester, started yeah. putting a couple of them in there, so. Yeah, but like a tutorial thing for, for faculty, yeah. I think will be really helpful. Because I think a lot yeah. of professors don't 
just don't yeah. know. Yeah. And especially, at least in our department, um, it seems like our part timers are mm -hmm. kind of out of the you know, they're not aware of, of some of these. So. Yeah, and we're getting and think, more and more. Well, part -timers. Exactly. They're teaching just, a lot. I think of just, oh, I think just yeah. awareness. Yeah. Yeah. More awareness of that. Like, or even the full timers. Yeah. Really, like, yeah, they are. These exercises. Yeah. And, and the faculty is, instructor services. So. Yeah. Send you what faculty and And you're kind of services. making life easier for us. You know, so why wouldn't people, if they knew about it, I right. think a lot of people would use it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, but maybe, you know, one thing you could do is you could contact the chair of departments mm -hmm. um, and have and ask them, you know, if they could do an announcement and go that for faculty meeting in the semester or maybe have one of the librarians come in to us. I think that, you know, department. I think our department at least would, you know, if you contacted the chair, would, you know, I think that they would be open to that kind of thing. Uh, I think most, I mean, I think most faculty yeah. would, and that might be the most effective way of getting the information out there, um, so that it doesn't get filtered out. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, the department chairs. And I just wanted to comment on some of the points that the faculty brought up. When um, we talked about lesson plans, I don't know if you noticed with body language, John Bynan uh, opened up his laptop and started looking for the lesson plans. Debbie Katz started writing it down. So that's something of high interest to the faculty and we have started them. And they can just plug and play, put it into their syllabus. And this is something that we would love if faculty would help us do more of these. Um, also, what I thought was really interesting is that uh, the teaching faculty don't seem to get the publicity about our library services. So I'm not sure why that's not happening. Like um, Annabelle was saying from the chair, but obviously the, her chair is not passing that information on. So that's probably some a discussion you could have about that. Do we have the minutes for the rest of this? And then the other thought that we came across with is that, you know, when you have a focus group and you start asking questions, things kind of either go differently or they bring up some stuff that are really important. And the thought that they talk about the best versus convenient sources and about the dis different disciplines that does research differently, that came uh, across in the uh, focus group as well. And you know, Wikipedia, they talked about that too. On and that's part of the, one of the sources too. Mm -hmm. So we thought mm -hmm. that would be really interesting for uh, you to just feed a couple of uh, episodes, uh, I want to say maybe, 30 seconds, 60 seconds that talks about all these different issues that they were talking with. And we didn't really ask them. You know, we just say suggestions, comments that you guys might have, or things that you might want to share with us. And they just started talking about it. So um, we just want to share that with you. My students are already prone to looking um, for online you know, full text sources and ignoring everything else. And I think as it stands now, the, um, the articles kind of invites them to do that because there's a moment where it says, let's see, let's say you want to look at full text. And so you click full text. Mm -hmm. And then, so it kind of reinforces that behavior and I'd rather have them understand that it's also important to look for things that aren't full text online and to find that physical copy or request that through your library loan if they need it because what they need is the best source, not the most convenient source. And I keep trying to tell them that it's the, it's the best sources you need to have, not, not the ones that you can get at 3 a.m. in your room. Yes. Yeah, so I was just going to say and then maybe also talk about how, okay, so you found this article and you read the abstract and it looks great and it's not online, how do you, like what would you do next? Kind of thing. Like, if it's not in the hard copy here, like go to ILL or you know, like have a little bit of a, um, a guide about that. That might help too. Because I think some of them just don't even know how. To, they, don't, yeah. they just ignore it, be, and they might not actually know how to get something that they can't get online. I'm like from a business school, and I mean, I remember I'm, I'm I was an anthropology major, and it was just assumed that we were going to use a library. And I went over to the business school, and they're they're always the farthest away from campus and campus the farthest away from the library of any school you know and it's only the guys that like to get a lot of exercise will come to the library so what do you do what why what are they what's the students inspiration for doing a research project like that 
Well, but I, well, for those of us who have, I have uh, my degrees in literature, um, I, I, have, I, I try to teach my students, you know, while academic articles definitely have value, there's something about the book as well. And it, there's it's in certain areas as well, um, there may not you know, necessarily be articles, but there's one really great book. They were at first sort of against it, but they finally decided that Wikipedia is here to stay. They actually use Wikipedia for their own research, so uh, we might as well make use of it. And they noticed that in our choosing a topic, we use Wikipedia for brainstorming. And I think it was Annabella that was a little concerned about that, but now she's come around to thinking it's okay because that's where students start. I mean, you start, you don't end there. So. And in our choosing a topic, we do specify that right. you use Wikipedia to start. It's not to finish, and it's not the only source. You want it if you don't. It's more like for to get a general idea, so that you can go deeper. You go to other sources. So she liked that part that we started Wikipedia, but we recommend other sources for them to use as well. So it's not a forbidden thing, or a forbidden fruit where students are like, yeah, I'm just going to use it. But it's like it's acceptable. It's common. Use this, but use others as well. So she really liked that part. And what was interesting about the disciplines is what sort of on uh, our majority that came were in the humanities, social sciences, so very much uh, book oriented or full text in person print as compared to the woman from business. Everything is online in her field. She wouldn't you know, use a book. It's all either Cornell Law Review or in LexisNexis. So it's sort of interesting to get that aspect. I think if we had more people maybe from you know, the sciences too, might have had a different uh, feedback. And um, I thought the best versus convenient was really good too, because a lot of times we focus on convenience versus best. And um, before we go into this, a couple of lessons learned was that um, when we first did our searching, finding, evaluating articles database, we talked about print and text, you know, all the different methods, and then we cut it back to make it shorter, and now we're going to add that back in based on the faculty input. Also, on the, um, the books, they brought up a really good point about serendipity and how searching in the stacks, and so we're going to add some clips about that, about, you know, here I am working in the fashion area, I found this, where without uh, using, you know, the online catalog. So we got some really good feedback that we will be incorporating. And then here's some of our other ideas. And uh, did you want to talk about the face-to-face? -face? OK. Um, what we want to do based on a lot of their feedback is offer training on how to use information literacy modules in the fall, like have um, maybe half an hour drop in or train the um, team leaders on how to do that for them. because. The information doesn't seem to be getting across as specifically as we much. I mean, our data is really hot, but um, we'd like to, you know, talk about as many ways that we could do that. And then the lesson plans, you can go in and look and see what we have. But we'd really um, love if librarians would help us write more lesson plans. And this book here, Teaching Information Literacy, all of the faculty get, and it has exercises that we can borrow and use and just cite the author. So right then and there, the faculty, like uh, Annabella and what's her face? What Christina. Yeah. Christina kept saying is they just want something to plug and play. Mm -hmm. So something to put in. So the more that we can provide faculty, like our assignment research calculator, our information literacy modules, our HMLIQ is going to make it easier for them to adopt it. And then I know Bang's really big on the embedded librarian, so I'm going to let her speak um, about that. I noticed that uh, in the a couple semesters ago, I did a, just a little beta trial for uh, being embedded into Blackboard. And um, it's just taking everything that you've already done, whether it's instruction, whether it's uh, a libguide, and putting all that information in one place where the students are and the faculty is, and that's in Blackboard. So what I did is I just talked to uh, the instructor and said, can you make me your TA? Can you make me an instructor or a TA for your class? And I can put all this information in so that before we have our library session, you know, I, will, I can teach from it, I can talk from it, and uh, it's in there so students can always refer back to it. And they're like, they're like yeah, great, no problem. And then as slowly as the semester progressed, um, I started adding more stuff. And it's just the resources that you will be using, the resource that's customized to the uh, class. 
and then you put your contact information in there. And when you uh, talk to the student, when you have your library session with them, whether in person or online, what you do is you say, you know, everything is here. Open up Blackboard, show it to them. These are the resources that you'll be using for your paper. These are some of the recommended databases that you should use. This is a libguide that I did that you can always refer back to. Here's my contact information. Contact me anytime any, you need help. Just on the subject line, put what class you're coming from so I know exactly what you're looking at. So when I talk to them on the phone or online or wherever it is, I know what class they're referring to and I know what session they're talking about so that I can help them, whether it's through email. And um, that really works for me. Um, so instead of a lot of times I don't do, if they are doing like hybrid classes, I like to do a class with them online where I'm actually going on to their collaborate, uh, Blackboard Collaborate, and I'm in there and they come in and they ask me questions and we go over some of the uh, stuff that I have in that folder for them. So that's another way of uh, offering that service. And as the school moves more and more online, the library's going to have to somehow move and incorporate into that environment. So, you know, this is a great way to do it, a great way to start with the hybrid classes. So, um, that's one thing that I wanted to kind of, in the fall, to get us started, especially with some of the team leaders that, you know, would love to get started. It's one way to do it is that way, embedded library. And then I just wanted to summarize our methodology because I think we sort of skipped that at the beginning. Basically, we had direct measures, so we had a rubric. That the, that the faculty would respond to, so from like, I think it was a four to one or zero scale, and that was summarized, which I think we got, what, then yeah. fours for the most part, yeah. and then um, the, the faculty commented, and then the focus group was where we got more of the indirect responses, so we did both. So we think we got um, good feedback. feedback, thank you. So I just wanna thank all the people who helped you know, it was a long process. Yeah. We started in 2010, and it went all the way up to like last semester. So you're talking about a good two, three years of just getting one piece in together at a time and just keep plotting, keep going. So, and I want to give a, a special shout out to Angel because he was so helpful for to meet with us to help us with how to do a focus group because it can be really tricky to run it correctly. So thank you. So, questions? Theater. Um, first, just a quick comment and then a, then a question. Um, I don't think any academic library has ever figured out effectively how to communicate the teaching faculty or research faculty. Even universities like Carnegie Mellon, James Mason, Syracuse, some others that have PR librarians, full-time jobs, struggle. So it's just, it, 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 it it's never a destination, it's always, I mean, it's always a, a journey, it's never that you arrive at some solution, and I applaud that you're making this effort. Um, the, the data is significant, um, and the fact you captured it and, and have plotted it so well is, is important, and I think it's a model that we could more effectively use elsewhere. But have you had discussions between the two of you or in your focus group about how the assessment might go one step further to close a loop to see whether there's correl you know, correlative data that suggests using ILM uh, FSs have a measurable impact on students? Not on whether it helps them to do an assignment, but some kind of, is, is there a way to get longitudinal data to see if broadening our suite of LMS offerings have an impact over time on rates to graduation, retention, any, you know, engagement, whatever you feel is worth measuring, but that is actually about their achievement. One of the things we did with the sales test, which we didn't get so many people, was to ask them. I mean, you can only ask two independent questions, and one was, did you take an information literacy tutorial or module? So that could be crossed with mm -hmm. that. When I, when I did the, my embedded uh, beta testing, um, I did it with two classes where 
I put up my all my stuff in the two classes, and they compared it with the class that didn't have that library or librarian uh, intervention. And I would say um, there was not a significant, but there was a slight increase in terms of the classes that actually had myself embedded into their class or one that didn't receive any library uh, instruction or library help at all. So that's why when I did it, I just did it as a beta for those two classes. And then after that, that's when I uh, started doing it more because I realized that there was an uh, increase in terms of the grades and in terms of the paper. Because we did one was with the paper comparing the two paper and one we did as an overall grade. So. That's just something on the side, but that's as close as I got to it, but I'm not sure. And in that, I include all the information with literacy modules that they have to take. Um, one of the faculty members commented that it, the information didn't seem to be moving from their chair down to the faculty in the department. And I know, I think it was last year, Van came to the chair of chairs meeting to talk about affordable learning solutions. And so it might be a suggestion, you know, not all the chairs go to this, but at least some do, that maybe you came to one of their meetings and at least laid out something so, or maybe give them a hand up so that maybe they could go back and at least talk to some people that are in their departments and um, Bernadette Muscat is going to be the chair of the chairs this year and I'm sure she's always looking for topics to present at these meetings so that just might be a suggestion it's not going to hit a lot of people but it'll hit some people so that we get all the chairs together all at once instead of going to individual departments right yeah, yeah. that makes sense they usually meet once a, a month mm -hmm. at noon they follow the same pattern. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, so that's basically what we have. And we just wanted to present on our findings now that we're done. We're like, we're done. Okay. <laughs> so we can start making changes to the uh, modules and um, you know, carry it on and then start the next phase of reassessing them again. Yes. And what you presented today be packaged on the list guide or certainly our All data uh, dashboard list guide should have some reference to this. Uh, everything is on, on our list guide our so it's on information the guide digital literacy okay. and on the OIE page. Good. And then we just showed you snippets of the focus group, and if anyone wants to watch the whole thing, or the we'll have that. <laughs> how long was how long did you have the we, we scheduled an hour, and I think we finished in 50 minutes. Um, we we scheduled an hour and 15 minutes. Okay. And then we did finish it in an hour, but they sat around and they just kept on talking yeah. for a while. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they. Had Addison or another student Addison video taping yeah. while they were there. And right, and they, they all signed releases. Right, they were all, oh, that was part of the deal right. for them. Yeah. Did you have other faculty that weren't on the video? Because I uh, thought you did. Yes, three of them that yeah. the asterisk said their name couldn't come. So yeah. they had to write a, okay. a, a long written yeah. summary. Sorry, I'm trying to find our um, lib guide. Go to research. <laughs> Do the present day lib guide. Well, if you go there, the information. Oh, yeah, the, the primary sources will have it. It should go directly to the research guide. And lib guides. So we do have. Um, Based on what the dean was asking, do you have any suggestions about student learning outcomes in our information literacy modules more than what we've done? One of the first places that I start 
that I know that um, across the country, universities are struggling with that very right. issue. It's not just us. Um, and uh, this past spring, I did have a conversation with uh, some of the universities, and I, I recall the University of Minnesota, one that was heading down that path of, of knocking down this, this issue of um, student learning outcomes and the impact of library. So, the conversation, uh, this is what I'll share with you, is we need, I, I would suggest the first place to start is what does the, the, the body of research literature about this right. tell us right now so that we can sort of put our arms around what's the extent of the knowledge in this area. Um, and then, and then let's, let's engage in our own um, discussion about how can we plan something out uh, for us. Interestingly enough, uh, tutorials have not been evaluated. There's only a few articles on them. But, and then so even going beyond that with the student learning outcomes is really major. Okay, so then if there's nothing there, then we uh, we uh, blaze it's a trail. not much there. Right. Blaze a trail, I like that. One thing that the CSU uh, cold assessment team is talking about are several of the CSUs have figured out a way for a very simple logon to all um, ILM S's. And over time, they hope to aggregate who actually logged on to their PeopleSoft um, data that would allow longitudinal studies to see whether students in aggregate, so you, mm -hmm. all ILM S's would be yeah, in this category, um, correlated to all of the student data that use them, whether over time there are you can begin to see patterns um, and whether there is a significant benefit to being engaged in our services through ION methods um, with random sample of students who don't, perhaps. Um, but they're all in early stages of exploring this. And no one, I think, has, I don't think anyone nationally has nailed this. And the literature is pretty thin. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Yes, thank you. Something told me inside that your love was untrue. Something